So I'd like everyone to just kind of scan the church and see all the people here and take a look at the people right next to you. So, I don't know about you, but I like to watch people. And with this wall, I like to watch people up close and personal. <laughs> I like to watch people because I mean, they're so different. They come in all shapes and sizes, different and diverse personalities. I mean, no two of us are just alike. And that's a good thing. And what a relief it is to know that I don't need to try to be like the person next to me or to try and be someone who I am not. Because God created us to be who we are. In Psalm 139, we read how God formed our inward parts and how he knitted us in our mother's womb. And so we praise him because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so in our second reading, St. Paul, he tells us that each of us is given individually different spiritual gifts by God. So why is that so important for us to know? First, it's because God doesn't distribute his spiritual gifts randomly or without purpose. So God didn't say one day, let us give some person, uh, person number 3 billion, 4 million, and 25, the spiritual gift of wisdom. Not at all. Because God is a personal God, he intentionally distributes his gifts to us by name. Second, God gives us spiritual gifts not only to build up the church and to serve others, but so that we might know joy. So we heard in the gospel, gospel acclamation, God has called us through the gospel to possess the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants us to possess his glory. God wants us to know his joy. And that is our entire life's mission, to be humble disciples of God's will, of God's glory, in order to possess in order to have within us and to lead others to the fullness of God's joy. And as Father John mentioned, we have a great example of that humble joyfulness in Blessed Solanus Casey. We have the great honor and the privilege of hosting the relic of Blessed Solanus Casey in the chapel. And it is his humility that allowed his spiritual gifts to lead many people to Jesus. And he was renowned for some of his spiritual gifts, his gift of healing and counsel and intercession. And there are as many spiritual gifts as there are people because God is without limit. Even after his death, over 60 years ago, his spiritual gifts continue to be active in the lives of others because he is a powerful intercessor. And so take advantage of the opportunity that you have to venerate the relic of Solanus Casey and ask him to intercede for you. Ask him to intercede for one of your loved ones and be specific. Now the Old Testament had many prophets who prophesied about the Messianic King. 
Now how exactly the king would be ushered in to save God's people wasn't exactly known. But what is known is that in the fullness of time, the king came into the world. And today we hear how he begins to manifest himself and exactly who he is. So let us take a look at the wedding in Cana. To begin, I think it's important for us to dispel the notion about the exchange between Jesus and Mary as being somehow a rebuke of her. There's no way. What is clear is that both Jesus and Mary were aware, fully aware, of who he was and what he came to do. And let us be sure to also recognize the great power of the Blessed Mother's intercession. Now the only reason that Mary would bring the lack of wine to her son's attention is because she knew that he could do something about it. But it wasn't just the wedding guests who had no wine, but the people of Israel who were thirsting for a Messiah, the Messiah, and were in fact without wine as well. And now her son, the long-awaited Messiah, would begin to manifest himself as the true bridegroom to all of the world and to begin his journey toward Calvary for the good of his bride, the people of God. Some of you may know that our liturgical readings come from the New American Bible Translation. And in the translations, we read how Mary and Jesus are invited to a wedding. And so we traditionally refer to that passage as the wedding in Cana. However, that translation, the translation that I use, I mean, and incidentally, I'm told that the, that translation, the Revised Standard Version, is the translation that St. John Paul II used or preferred, and he considered it to be the most accurate. I know I heard that somewhere. In it, it doesn't say that Jesus was invited to the wedding. It says that Jesus was invited to their marriage. You can see that the difference is significant. A couple can expend all kinds of efforts trying to find the most picture-perfect church for their wedding day and never invite Jesus to their marriage. But there are also many couples who see the moment of consent. It's not just saying yes to each other, but saying yes to having Jesus as their center, as the very foundation of their marriage. Now we never hear anything more about this young couple in Cana. But what we do know is that when a couple prayerfully and intentionally invites Jesus to their marriage, Jesus manifests himself in the most unexpected and glorious ways. That's true in every area of life, whether we're married or not. When we invite Jesus into our life as our center, as our foundation, he will manifest himself and we will encounter him as our Lord and our Savior. But Jesus and his mother, they won't force themselves into our lives. They have to be invited. And there is no area of our life that can be considered to be sort of out of bounds or off limits. Because Jesus is either master of our whole life or he's not master of any of it. Now, while we are all created as unique individuals, each of us very different from the other, 
There's not a single one of us here today that was created in an image and a likeness other than that of God. And the God who created us and the God who loves us wants us to possess his glory. He wants us to know his joy. And St. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, he tells us how to do that. He says, so whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So let us be like that young couple in Cana. And let us invite Jesus into our marriages. Invite Jesus into our homes, into our work, and most of all, into our entire life.